So welcome back. Um, today's video we're going to be looking at AAS, which stands for Atomic Absorption Spectroscopy. Um, it's another one of our analytical techniques, um, and so we're going to explain how it works and then go through some example questions. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is draw a little diagram of what an AAS machine uh, would be laid out. Um, so we've got kind of like that box where everything is in, um, and that's usually connected to some sort of computer. Now, I called it a machine in real life. If you tell a scientist it's a machine, they will get really mad at you because they like to call it an instrument. Um, but I sometimes mess up, so I call it machine. Um, they can just get over it. So uh, inside this box, we have all the components, but we usually can't see very much. Inside one part, we'll have a metal uh, cathode lamp. Now that's gonna give out a ray of light of some variety. We're gonna have our atom atomizer um, that's going to be connected to our sample. Um, we also have something called a, a monochromata. Uh, don't worry about the colors, that's just to show different parts. And also we've got our detector. Um, so we're going to go through the different parts and say what, what's what and how, how they work and what does what. So, um, our metal ca cathode lamp. That is made up of some sort of metal. has to be specific to the, the metal that we want to analyze. Let's just say that this is one is, a, is an iron metal cathode lamp. And when we say lamp, we mean lamp like a torch. Um, so just like a torch produces light. Um, that's what this is doing. So it's producing some sort of light that's going across and, and hitting a detector. And the idea is that um, that lamp is going to produce like 100% light. And then our sample is going to come and it's going to absorb some light. So um, it's going to vaporize our sample and the sample might absorb light if iron is present. Um, and so then the light that hits to that te detector will be less if there was any iron present. Um, so first of all, let's just talk about the lamp um, and how it produces the light. So the idea is that lamp is made out of iron, it gets bombarded with particles, and when it does that, it produces uh, light, so specific uh, wavelengths of light that are specific to iron atoms. And so all of this is, is just iron, and it's specific because whenever we have an atom, um, atoms have a certain number of electrons, but they've also got a unique electron configuration because um, even if you've got elements which have the same valence electrons, those valence electrons are in different shells. And so what can happen is that those electrons can absorb um, energy from some sort, usually in the form of light, and the amount of light it's absorbed um, will appear on an absorption spectrum. Now when that happens, uh, that electron is going to go up, it's going to go to a higher energy state, but it doesn't want to be at that higher energy state. So it wants to go back down, and in order to do so, uh, it needs to emit the light that it absorbed, so it's at the right energy level now, and when it emits that light, it produces a ray of light, um, and also produces a spectrum called an emission spectrum, and that spectrum is, is kind of like the same as as this absorption spectrum but the inverse. So before, that's the light that was absorbed. Now we've got that the light that was emitted. Um, so they kind of like mirror images of each other. Um, but that's specific to each element, um, the, the emission spectrum that's produced because those electrons exist in specific energy uh, levels. And so each, so an iron atom will produce um, one type of specific wavelength of light from a metal cathode lamp, whereas copper would produce a different one. So, so iron produces that light, it, it shines across, um, and what we do is we have some sort of sample, um, and that sample gets sucked up. So any iron in there goes up, um, and it gets atomized, meaning it gets vaporized, and now it can interact with the light. And if we've got any iron present, um, it will absorb uh, the light and it will block light from getting to the detector. So let's just say that you had a certain amount in there um, and 50% of the light now wasn't getting through. Um, if 50% didn't get through and 
that means that we absorbed about 50%. But it's a relative number, so we can't actually quantify that unless we know the concentration of iron in our sample. And so what we do is we need to make a calibration curve. Now before we talk about calibration curves, let's talk about this monochromata. So the idea is that this monochromata, um, it filters out the wavelengths of light. Because when those particles are interacting, you could get other bits of light being produced. And rather than having that light hit the detector, we only want that specific wavelength from, from the iron to hit the detector. So this filters out the other stuff so that we only get the light from the original lamp hitting the detector. And so let me just label that detector. And then once that hits the detector, that reads out um, and gives an absorbance level to the computer. Um, and tells us how much was absorbed. Um, now, as we said, we need to make a calibration curve, and that's because just testing one sample will give us some sort of absorbance reading, but we don't really have anything to compare that to. So instead, we need to make a calibration curve. So I'll, we'll come back to that in a sec. A calibration curve is where we have um, a set of absorbance values oops, plotted against a set of uh, concentrations. So we would test um, samples of, of iron of varying concentration. So let's just say this is 5, so this is in ppm, 5 ppm, 10, 15, 20, 25, and that's 0. And then we have our absorbances. Now, while absorbance doesn't normally have uh, values, it is common to have something like 0.1, and, oh, actually, let's make that. 0.2, so 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.81, etc. And so let's just say that we tested uh, for 5 and we found that the absorbance was about 0.4. Well, okay, when you go up to 10, you're doubling the concentration. That means we have double the amount of, of particles in there, so we're actually going to double the amount of absorbance happening as well. And so, what did I put? About 0.4, so it would probably double. Um, and go up to about 0.8. I haven't probably drawn my graph very well because then the next thing is saying, okay, well, at 15 ppm, you're going to get even more absorbance and at 20 ppm, you'd get about double half, so even more absorbance up there. Let me make my graph a bit bigger. Um, and the idea is by doing it in incremental values or a set of um, increasing uh, standard concentrations, we can then plot that and it should be a linear relationship um, and so now we, we can get that line of best fit. And if we were to test an unknown sample now, uh, so let's just say we took a, a sample of iron. Um, let's just say, um, oh, so the example I like to use is spinach. Spinach has lots of iron in it. Now spinach normally looks green, but I'll just draw it purple. Um, and so that spinach, even if I, so if I've got two grams of spinach, not all of that spinach is going to be iron, um, but I want to know how much iron is in that spinach. And so I'm going to dissolve that spinach in, in something else. So let's say I dissolve it in 20 mils of, of HCl. Um, and then I'm going to test that. So I've, I've done, sorry, well first I've done my calibration curve. So I tested the absorbance of 5 ppm, 10 ppm, etc. And then when I test this spinach, I get that I get an absorbance of about, let's just say about here, and that goes along and we can plot, see where that hits our line, our calibration curve, and go down from there. So without being too accurate about it, um, it's just above 15, so let's say it's about 14.5 um, ppm. So. Um, my concentration of iron in that 20 mil sample was 14.5 ppm. So the idea is that first we test a series of known concentrations um, and we do it in cent increments in order to get this calibration curve and then we take an unknown sample and we test that and see what the absorbance is um, and if the absorbance was around here we go across, we see where did the, that hit the line, and we again come down to see what the concentration is. Now I've done this in PPM, it could be in different types of um, 
concentrations like Molsepolita or PPB. It just depends what you're looking for. Um, but the idea is now, my first question was still, how much iron was in the spinach leaf? Now, all I've done is I've found out how much, or what the concentration of iron is in that sample. I haven't found the spinach leaves. That's a bit different. So in order to now look at the spinach leaves, I need to know, well, actually, how much mass of iron was in that sample to begin with? And so we said it was 14.5 uh, ppm. So for 14.5 ppm of iron uh, in the 20 mil sample, um, what we can do is we can work out the mass of iron in that sample. And we can do that because ppm, the units for ppm, is milligrams on litre. And we know what the ppm is, we know how um, much volume we had in our sample and we want to find out that milligrams. So if we rearrange this we can get that milligrams is going to be equal to ppm times by the number of litres. ppm was 14.5 and our litres, if we change that 20 mils into litres we get 0.02 litres. Let me just get my calculator. So that gives me 0.29 milligrams. So that means that in this sample of spinach um, HCL mixture, we had 0.29 milligrams of iron. Now that's great, but how does that help us with our original question um, of how much iron was in, in the spinach leaves, uh, in our two grams of spinach? Well, the idea is if we had 0.29 milligrams of iron in this sample, that only came from the spinach that we put in. And so that would have had to mean that there was 0.29 milligrams of iron in, this, in that 2 grams of spinach that we had before. So if we know that, um, then we can say, okay, well, we know a mass of, of spinach in there. What we can also do is look at what's the concentration of iron in, in the spinach. And so looking at concentration again, we can look at it in a few different ways. It, de oh, it also depends what the question is asking us. So sometimes it says, what's the concentration in, in ppm? So we can do that as well. Now, if we think about ppm, we said that it's milligrams per litre, but we also know that a thousand mils is in one litre. And if one mil is approximately one gram, that means um, a thousand grams, which is approximately one kilogram is the same as saying one litre is approximately one kilo. So ppm we can also write as milligrams per kilo. Now we haven't got uh, a sample in kilos, we've got it in grams, so we'll probably have to convert that to grams, I'm um, sorry, to kilos. But what we can also do is find out the concentration by doing uh, mass divided by kilos. And so um, our mass was 0.29. Uh, milligrams and we divided by kilos so uh, two one two three so this is 0 0.002 um, kilograms and that would give us a concentration of um, 145 ppm uh, so that means that the concentration of iron in two grams of spinach was approximately 145 ppm. I don't know if that's right or real. Um, I was just making those numbers up. But that's an, an example. Um, let's do another example of another case where um, we could use AES. Now, AES is very commonly used to, to look at um, the presence of metals in different things, so such um, as in like a lake of water. They might want to know if there's any contaminants in that water, for example, lead. Um, and so we might take a water sample out and, and do some AES analysis on that water sample to see if there's a, um, a contamination of lead in there. Now there might be a very, very minute amount of lead in there, it's, it's hard to tell, um, but probably it would be very, very small. So probably we're going to look at it in, in terms of PPB. And so the very first thing we'd have to do is we'd have to put in a, a lead metal cathode lamp. Um, it's going to do its analysis. want to make a calibration curve first. So, oh, here's my detector. And so I'm going to test um, different concentrations of lead. I'm going to do it in PPB because 
lead shouldn't be too concentrated. Um, so let's just say 5, 10. It really, it could be anything. Um, I'm just making it up. And, and when I tested that, I found that my um, calibration curve looked a little bit like this. And so if I plot, oh, actually, and also I'll just put over here another one. Um, not a very good calibration curve, I'm just making it up. And this is my absorbance, of course. Um, so they, they are um, using known concentrations. But then I'm going to take my water sample, so my little bit of water, and I want to test that as well. I'm going to put that into my sample and test that. And when I do that, I find that the absorbance uh, plots in about here somewhere. Um, so I go across and I find where that is um, on my curve, go down, okay, well let's have a look, well it's approximately um, maybe 22.5, uh, um, oh and sorry this is in PPV, so the concentration was about 22.5 PPV of, uh, what did I say, lead in that water sample. Now, a question might, might be that um, there are safe uh, percentage of, uh, or oh, sorry, a, a safe concentration of lead in water. Is this a safe concentration? Um, it just depends on, on what that concentration is. So, for example, if we said that um, 30 ppb um, was to be considered the safe level and we tested a water sample and got 22.5 ppb, then it can say that yes, that is within the safe levels. Um, of of lead in water. However, if it was actually that it was 10 ppb was the safe levels and we got 22.5, we could say that, okay, that water sample does not contain the safe levels. Possibly some sort of contamination has happened. Um, so that's another way to look at it. Uh, that one hasn't involved uh, much um, calculations. However, AES, you could do something like with our spinach leaves or something with this, just depends what you're asking for. Um, if you've got any other questions about AES or any other question examples you'd like to go through, um, put it in the comments below, um, and I'll see and I'll, I'll go through them or I'll answer them if I if I can. Um, like and subscribe if you can. Uh, there will be more videos coming out throughout the year as we go through the topic. Um, this AES will finish off topic one for our volumetric analysis and uh, monitoring the environment. So that's why I've used like water examples because really we're looking at how can we use these things to, to monitor the environment. So yeah, thanks for, um, thanks for watching and uh, have a good weekend.